Good morning and Merry Christmas, friends. My name is John Schubert and I'm one of the pastors here and I tell you that uh, in case you're a guest with us. And secondly, because those of you who are regular, I'm wearing a tie today <laughs> and you may not recognize me. So, Merry Christmas. One of my favorite uh, Christmas, quote unquote, verses in scripture is found in Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. It said, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's a packed verse, isn't it? Describing the identity of our Savior, this one Jesus Christ, whom we call Lord and Savior. The promise of God's gift to mankind the promise that he gave concerning his Messiah Savior is the focus of the Old Testament. It's the focus of the entire Bible, but certainly the Old Testament. Um, starting as early as Adam and Eve <clears throat> sinning in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3 and be, being repeated regularly all the way through the passage of the Old Testament, we have this promise of a savior which dominates the pages of scripture. For example, a small prophecy from Micah, a minor prophet, in his fifth chapter, second verse, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth one for me, one who is to be ruler of Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. That's pretty impressive too, isn't it? So we have this, this body of Old Testament scripture that repeatedly presents to us this promised coming Savior. And then we get to the New Testament and this Savior is introduced to us firsthand in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we've been studying our way through the Gospel of Mark, and so without leaving the context of the place that we find ourselves in this morning in Mark chapter 12, I'm going to mine out for you this story of this Savior that is seen repeatedly presented in the Old Testament. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 12, I'm going to read for you a section there, verses 1 through 12, that I think you will see this great theme of scripture, the, the, really the theme of our redemptive story in the person of Jesus Christ being born as a child. And, and what we're going to come across here really is a parable from Jesus to the people that were willing to listen to him. Remember the, the context. This is the final week of Jesus's life. He is being attacked from the religious leaders, which is typical, but in this case, uh, it's the final week of his life, and these attacks result in his death on Calvary. But in the context of, of this, uh, this particular attack, where they question his authority to go in and, and turn tables over in the uh, temple, you remember the cleansing of the temple we talked about last week, uh, Jesus tells a parable to them. And although this parable was told as a condemnation against these religious leaders that had questioned his authority and had a long history of rebelling against God in Israel's past, this parable contains the centerpiece of the plan of redemption and the anchor of hope for all who put their trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So I want you to view this story this morning, this parable from the lips of Jesus uh, from the perspective of Christmas. All right, listen as I read Mark 12, 1 through 12. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant and to the tenants rather to get from them some of the fruit in the vineyard, from the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. 
And he sent them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and they killed him. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Can you see Christmas there in that story? It's there, isn't it? Yeah, and I, wanna, I want to preach to you from this text this morning from this Christmas perspective that I've asked you to embrace. The incarnation of God. This parable of condemnation has within it, like I said, the great centerpiece of God's loving plan of redemption, which is the necessity of God taking on flesh. John 1.18, the word became flesh by necessity for your salvation and mine. So let me explain the parable to you. I'm certain you've thought about these things and maybe even heard of them. Uh, from some place, but the vineyard owner in this parable, of course, is God, right? He, he built it, he established it, and then he leased it out to these tenants. And the tenants in the, in the parable were Israel. The servants that the, the owner of the vineyard sent to the tenants were prophets. The rejection and abuse of the servants was the rejection and abuse of God's servants by the people of Israel, particularly the religious leaders of Israel's history. So the theological gem that I'm asking you to look at is found in verse 6. Look at it with me again. The vineyard owner had still one other. Besides all the servants that he sent that got abused and murdered, he had one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them. There is the theological gem. There is the story, the centerpiece of the redemption story. And, of course, this theological gem of God becoming man is a mysterious theological reality, isn't it? A divine being, the divine being, the creator of the universe, becoming one of his creation? How mysterious is that? Paul calls it a mystery in 1 Timothy 3.16. And we read from Jesus' lips that, that God, or the vineyard owner, sent his son. The question we must ask if we're going to keep track of the Christmas story is sent him from where? Where did he come from? Well, look back in verse 1 of Mark 12. It says that after the vineyard owner built this vineyard, did everything necessary for the success of the tenants, he went away into another country. That other country was heaven. And from heaven, the vineyard owner, God, sent his son to the vineyard to collect rent. So there you have an understanding of the players or the characters of this Christmas parable. And the first thing that I want you to see from this Christmas parable is the spiritual failure of Israel. The spiritual failure of Israel. In order to correct their sinful ways, as the parable suggests, God sent faithful messengers to his people throughout Old Testament history. You can read through the Old Testament once and see this without any study whatsoever. You'll see time after time, prophets showing up, leaders showing up, trying to correct the, the, the horrible course that Israel was on in order to spare them from God's judgment. God sent these men to them continually. And what did they do? 
Just what Jesus' parable said they did. They mistreated, they abused, they even killed these prophets. Jesus, in reviewing the history of Israel, in Matthew 23 said this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets, how many times would I have wrapped you up in my arms, but you would not. Jesus was remembering all the times as the God of heaven, he had sent messenger after messenger after messenger to correct the wayful in Israel's history. And they would not. So let's see here, first of all, the provision of God for his people Israel. Verse 1 describes it in parable form. It said that he planted a vineyard, he put a fence around it, dug a pit for the winepress, built a tower. He did everything necessary to make the tenants successful. They received everything. All provision was theirs. Let's think about this in terms of Israel, the Jews. Abraham, who was the first Jew, was called out of the land of Ur, right? Remember? He was called out of the land of Ur. And at that time, Abraham was godless, could care less about God, in fact, was an idolater. God called him out of that mess, out of that sinful slime, and into a special arrangement, a special relationship with himself. That's provision. That's what we read in chapter 12, verse 1 of Mark. This is what he did for the tenants. And he, he did the same thing with all of Abraham's descendants. The first few are called patriarchs, like the son of Abraham, Isaac, the promised son, who Abraham and Sarah bore in their 90s. That was provision alone, and the story could have stopped there and would have been a success, but it continued. He gave Isaac's offspring, Jacob, and Jacob's offspring, the 12, who became the 12 tribes, everything they needed. He defended them, supported them, sustained them, provided all things necessary to be successful tenants. And then when they went to Egyptian slavery because of the famine in the promised land, they went to Egypt to eat, he upheld them, he sustained them, he rescued them, and eventually freed them from Egyptian captivity, slavery. And then brought them back faithfully into the promised land and gave them back their land flowing with milk and honey. Did God provide for his people or not? He did, didn't he? Repeatedly. Now, I want you to keep your finger in Mark 12 and turn with me to Acts chapter 9. Mark 12, Acts 9. Now, for some of you Calvinists in the room, don't get excited. All right? We're not going to go too far into Acts 9. We're going to stop at the beginning. You can deal with your Calvinistic aspirations later this afternoon. But listen to God's provision for his people in Romans 9, verses 4 and 5. They are Israelites, and to them belong, now listen to all the things that God provided for them. Adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship the promises to them belong the patriarchs and from their race according to the flesh is the Christ who is God over all blessed forever amen did God provide for his people or not he provided didn't he abundantly provided for his people it it's stunning to think of the provision of God for this group of people protected them from all their enemies we read in the Old Testament that he made it rain on their crops while it didn't rain on their neighbors. Continually providing for, making them successful, giving them blessing after blessing after blessing in hopes that they would simply follow him. And yet they would not. Now, with your thumb remaining in Mark 12, turn with me backwards to Isaiah chapter 5. Verses 1 through 4. Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 4. This is Isaiah writing a poem, an inspired poem. In other words, inspired by God. Uh, but he wrote it to Israel. Verse 1. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. 
My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Could I have done anything else to make it successful? The answer obviously is no. So Old Testament, New Testament, all over human history, we have God's provision for his people. So let's look at the unfaithfulness of Israel. The unfaithful response to all this is breathtaking. In Mark chapter 12, so we're back to Mark 12. We're going to look at how the parable in verses 2 through 5 reflects the unfaithfulness of Israel. The sending of the messengers and the forsaking of God and the abuse and murder of God's messengers. One example of this is found in Jeremiah 7, verse 25 and 26. From the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt, remember that? That God protected them, sustained them in the land, and then he brought them out of the land. Provision, provision, provision. Uh, I have persistently, this is God speaking through Jeremiah, I have persistently sent all my servants, the prophets, to them day after day, yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. Nehemiah 9.26, another example. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you, and they committed great blasphemies. This is a description of the unfaithfulness of Israel that Jesus is referring to in his parable. Let me review some history for you. Prophet Zechariah was stoned to death in 2 Chronicles 24. Uriah the priest was killed with a sword between the altar and the tabernacle. Jeremiah was beaten, put in stocks, and thrown into a pit. Others that you may recognize, Amos, Micah, Isaiah, who was cut in half with a saw. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Habakkuk were all killed by the people of Israel because they simply brought a message from God to them saying, please turn from your sin. Then we see in verses 6 and 7, back in Mark, I'm sorry to jump all around like this, but you have to, you have to follow me to get it. All right, we're back in Mark. We're back in Mark here. Uh, in verses 6 and 7, by the way, which is the focus of Jesus' parable, uh, he records amazing words about the plan of redemption. Look at these verses once again with a clear eye. He still, that is the, the vineyard owner, still had one other, a beloved son, someone beyond all these servants that potentially could gain the interest and attention and respect of the tenants. He had one other, a beloved son. And that word beloved has the idea of only in it. The reason he's beloved, the same reason that Isaiah was beloved by Abraham and Isaac was because he was their only son. He had one other, a beloved son. Finally, after all his attempts, he sent him to them. What amazing words that reveal to you and me sitting here 2,000 years after this parable was first spoken, the plan of redemption. The tenants thought that killing the heir, according to Jesus' parable, would mean that they would get the vineyard for themselves. That's what they say. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. It says there in verse 7, they, they, they never wanted to follow the landlord. They didn't want him ruling over them, demanding a portion of the produce, having to pay rent. I mean, who wants to pay rent? They thought, let's kill this heir, and this place will be ours. In the same way Israel didn't want anyone ruling over them, and they wanted to be the vineyard, to have the vineyard for themselves, 
This parable shows the rebellious heart of Israel and how they've always wanted independence from God. It's always been this way, not just in Jesus' day. That's the point of all these messengers being sent. So the, me the, the meaning of this parable wasn't hard to understand. These guys understood it. Look at verse 12. <laughs> it says, so they left him because they perceived that he had told the parable against them. And he had. These guys were sharp. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. the, the son that was finally sent was the one standing in front of them telling them this parable. And they saw it. They recognized it. The only and beloved son. This is the one whose words they were listening to to describe their actual rebellion against God and their forefathers' rebellion against God. This beloved son was common biblical language to describe the Messiah's relationship to the Father, to describe Jesus' relationship to his Father. You see this as you read through the Gospels. I and my Father are one. I am the beloved Son. Respect my Father's authority. On and on it goes throughout the Gospels. And in his baptism, remember what the Father said about the Son. Remember? This is my what? Beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus was this beloved Son in his own parable. Jesus was the fulfillment of all these Old Testament prophecies. Verses 10 and 11. Look there quickly in Mark 12. Verses 10 and 11 record Jesus' reference to Psalm 118. He's quoting Psalm 118 here when he says, Have you not read the scripture? Which meant, he, didn't, he knew they had read it. He wasn't asking a question. He was saying, you've heard this before. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous. And that's a quote of Psalm 118, which every one of the people he was listening to knew was a messianic psalm. Every one of them. There was no doubt. They all embraced that reality. This psalm was speaking about the coming Messiah, and Jesus picks it up and uses it for himself. There's no confusion about what Jesus is saying. So what was the owner of the vineyard supposed to do? They killed all of his messengers, and now they've killed his son? The, the, the tenants had not only refused to pay their fair rent, but they mistreated and killed the servants he sent to collect the rent. And then going beyond all reason and demonstrating colossal rebellion, they killed the heir, the son of the property owner. Hoping to take the vineyard for themselves? What kind of derangement requires that? So Jesus asked this question. <laughs> Look at verse 9. To prick their conscience. He goes, what will the owner of the vineyard do? Pray tell. What would you do if you were the owner of the vineyard? He's asking his listeners. What would you do? <laughs> well, in Matthew's account, the religious leaders were sucked right in to Jesus' parable, and they were listening, not yet having figured out it was about them. And in Matthew's account, the leaders responded with great aggravation and said, the owner will take those miserable wretches and cut them to pieces. That's what they say in Matthew. Oh, whoops, he's talking about us, is how it went. So now we come to the judgment of Israel in verse 9. What will the owner of the vineyard do? Let your conscience speak for a minute. You all know what the owner of the vineyard would do, in other words. He will come, Jesus responded to his own question, and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. That's what he'll do. He will give his vineyard to another. And here is the amazing twist in the story for you and me this morning. Can you see it? He's going to give the vineyard 
to someone else. To others here in Jesus' parable is a reference to the church. It's a reference to you if you've embraced Jesus Christ. I'm going to take this amazing vineyard, this kingdom of God, this family of God, and since Israel rejected it, I'm going to turn and hand it to you. That's what Jesus said. I'm going to give it to others. Now, if it were left just there, we might be a little confused about what all this means. But because the Holy Spirit knew that you'd be confused and I'd be confused about what all this means, he gives us the book of Romans. And in Romans chapter 11, we see this whole thing unfold from the pen of the Apostle Paul. Look at Romans 11, 11. You don't have to turn there, it's on the overhead. So I ask, did they, Israel, did Israel stumble in order that they might fall? Did God just set them up so they'll look stupid? No. By no means, Paul says. Rather, why did they fall? Through their trespass, listen closely, Christian. Listen to why you're in. Listen to why you're in. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. It's come to you. Because they failed miserably at tending the vineyard and not producing the fruit that was required of them, God, the, the owner of that vineyard, has taken that responsibility and that right away from them and given it to the Gentiles. That's us in this room. He's given his vineyard to you and me to tend, to manage, to produce fruit in. Now, listen to the 25th verse of Romans 11. Now speaking to the church, to the Gentiles. This is what Paul writes. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers, the mystery that Jesus spoke about back in Mark 12. All right, I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. They responded the way they did by God's intent so that you and me can be included in the family of God. We are now the new tenants. And why, why do you deserve this? Well, you don't. <laughs> Neither did they. Anybody who comes to God comes by faith in his generosity, faith in his son, right? Right? Not merit. He didn't turn and give us the vineyard because we're so qualified. No. Because he's gracious and merciful. So don't misunderstand the efforts of God in sending all the messengers and finally sending his son. And by the way, God knew that sending messengers and sending his son would be received by rejection and the killing of his son. This wasn't a surprise to God. This was his intent. This was how it was orchestrated in eternity past to bring the most glory to God and the most joy to us. This was the only way. The way Jesus lays out this plan of redemption in his parable, it was the only way to accomplish his loving purposes for all of mankind, not just Israel. Aren't you glad about that? that this plan wasn't just for Israel? If it were, this room would be empty. This is how God would get you into the vineyard. This is how God gets you into the kingdom. This is how God gets us into his family, by the rejection of Israel, of his son. They murdered him, remember? So this is what verses 10 and 11 in Mark 12 are describing. Again, have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Is it marvelous in yours? Friends, this stone, which is a description of Jesus, 
that the builders, that is, Israel religious leadership, they rejected him, is actually the centerpiece of the whole redemption story. Without him, it all falls apart. There is no redemption story without the stone, without Christ, without his rejection, without the hard-hearted Israelites. Jesus is and always has been the focus of God's plan of redeeming mankind from their sinful rebellion. This is why God had to become man. This is why Jesus was born. This is why we celebrate Christmas. Right here, Mark 12. So let's move now into the spiritual expectations of the church. We have the spiritual failures of Israel. Now let's look at the expectations of those to whom the vineyard has now been given. Here it is. What does God expect of you, of me? The vineyard is ours. Now what? Well, if Israel would not produce fruit, which was by God's design, then he would give the vineyard to another, us, the church. And the church has been bearing the fruit of the gospel of grace ever since the day of Pentecost, ever since its inception. Haven't they? Yes, Human history is full of the fruit of the church. Colossians 1, for example, verses 5 through 6. Of this hope you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing. That's what the church now is doing with the vineyard. It's bearing fruit and increasing the kingdom of God as it is or as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood it, the grace of God and all of its truth. John 15, 8. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. You want to prove to be you are now the, the co-heir of the vineyard? You want to prove that you actually have embraced Jesus Christ? Bear fruit. That's how you do it. That's the only way you do it. Bear fruit. Like the tenants of the Old Testament couldn't seem to pull off. Bear fruit. So let's look at the provision of God. We've looked at the provision that God had given Israel in producing this vineyard and giving them the property. Let's, let's, let's uh, look at our situation. Has he provided for us? As the new tenants? Well, to begin with, I would say yes. How about Jesus? He's given us Jesus. That's what he says here. Finally, he sent to them his own son. Sent to who? To you. To me, the new tenants. And if he's willing to give us his son, is there more included in the arrangement? Oh, yeah, just like there was with Israel. Listen to Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He has given us not only his son, but everything that is associated with his son. Think about what you know about the gifts of God for his people. Not Israel, but you, his church. Let's review a few of them. Jesus, of course, unto us a son is given. This is what we've been singing about, reading about, thanking God for over the past few weeks here during our Advent celebration. Unto us a son is given. Praise him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Two. What else has he given us? What else is in association with his son? How about the Holy Spirit? Yes, Jesus said in John 14, 16 that he would give the Holy Spirit to the new tenants. Chapter 14, verse 16 of John, And I will ask the Father, Jesus said, and he will give you another helper, capital H, to be with you forever. And chapters 14, 15, and 16 of John's Gospel talk about this gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus has given us, the new tenants, to help us tend well, 
to help us bear fruit, to help us grow in sanctification. So he's given us Jesus. The vineyard owner has given us his son. He's given us the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, he's given us the scriptures. Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16 said, All scripture is given for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. We have no excuse not to be able to produce fruit. We have Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the scriptures. And then, of course, not to to uh, have any of you feel bad about who you are, God has given you to the church, if you're in Christ. You, insignificant you, are a gift from God to his people. You're intended to be a blessing, if you're a believer, to the new tenants. You're intended to be a source of encouragement to those who are now tending God's vineyard. You were specifically given to the new tenants to be a blessing. You remember the one another's of the New Testament? We have about 35 of them we've counted here in our church. Love one another. Pray for one another. Teach one another. Give to one another. And on and on the one another's go. That's what people do who are a blessing given by God to his people, the church. The new tenants, each of you, do you think you view yourself that way? Do you view yourself as a particular and specific gift from God, the vineyard owner, to the new tenants? Or do you see yourself as the fifth wheel, not seeing where you fit, not wondering? How do you see yourself? God intends you to see yourself as a gift to this body at Sun Valley of believers, to be a gift to the new tenants that make up his universal church, to the the church that resides in Indonesia, to those that are in Mexico with Dwight and Sarah. We, at this church, those of you in this room, are expected and designed by God to be an encouragement to the universal church, not just those here in this room. But we start here, right? (laughs) It's so easy to think about it the wrong way. We think, oh, I'm going to be a blessing to those people over there and forget you. You know, no. We are first and foremost to be a blessing to one another. God's gift. So has God provided for us the new tenets? Yeah, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the scriptures, other believers. See, the church is made up of regenerated people. We as individual believers make up the church of God that has been given this vineyard to manage and to produce fruit. The next point is the question, are we going to be faithful? Where the tenants, the first tenants, were unfaithful, the first tenants in verse 7 said, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him. Are we going to be faithful? Come, let us kill him. Is another way of saying we don't want God to rule over us. We're tired of this vineyard owner, you know, pressing us down, requiring things of us. We're done with that. We're going to kill the heir. Let's get rid of him. And then we can run our own lives as we wish. Listen to what commentator David Garland writes about the Mark 12 passage. He says this, Covetous makes humans want what they should not have. It makes them think that this desire should be filled at all costs. Other people become things to exploit and our desires become our gods, small g. Do humans think that by erasing God from their lives, killing the sun, killing the air, that they can take control of their earthly and eternal destinies? Apparently so. Here is the utter foolishness of sinful rebellion against God. We think that if we just ignore the air, ignore the sun, do it that, that we're agreeable with, then it'll be better for us? No. No. 
In Jesus' parable, the tenants killed the beloved son. And two days after Jesus spoke this parable, these leaders of Israel actually put him to death, trying to erase God. We can essentially do the same thing by ignoring or disobeying his word. We can try to run our own lives, even as Christians. We claim to embrace Jesus, but then want to live independent of God. No, that's the same error, the same sin that the first tenets exercised. Are you giving God his due in your life? Are you paying rent? You're the new tenant. Are you responding to the owner of the vineyard from all the benefits that he's given you? Is it evident? Do you embrace Jesus as the beloved son that he is? What have you done with Jesus Christ? God sent him to you as he sent him to Israel. Have you received him or have you dismissed him? Have you claimed to receive him, follow him, obey him, but see very little fruit? What have you done with Jesus? He is the son of the vineyard owner. What have we done with him? It is God's will that whoever has received his benevolence should bear fruit. John 15, 8. This is, by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. How do you prove to be a disciple of Jesus? How do you prove to be the actual tenant of his vineyard? You bear fruit. John 15 is all about this very thing. The goal of God's grace in our lives is bearing fruit. The, the, the goal of being a tenant in his vineyard is production. Not working for your salvation, but working out your salvation. The lack of fruit bearing is why the first tenants were cast out. So if you've been granted a place in God's vineyard by his grace through his son, who was given to us, and is the vine, by the way, from which we receive all of our spiritual strength and sustenance, John 15, 5. I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you know the story. There is an exception, an expectation, rather, of fruit production. If you're connected to the vine, if you're the new tenant. But it seems that at times we would rather not be accountable to God, the owner of the vineyard. Do we, even as professing believers, want independence from God? What a great day to examine your heart. Christmas Sunday. Actually, Christmas Sunday. God has sent his son. Now let's conclude by looking at the judgment of the church. There was a judgment on Israel, right? It said he cast them out of the vineyard and destroyed them. And if Israel wouldn't be spared judgment, do you think we ought to be spared judgment? I want you to, again, flip with me back to Romans 11. I want you to, I mean, I, I could simply sit here or stand up here and say, yeah, we're going to be judged. Goodbye, have a great Christmas. Um, but uh, that probably wouldn't uh, settle in your heart too well. So I'm going to read verses 17 through 21 of Romans 11. <clears throat> Paul said, But if some of the branches were broken off, that is, the branches that original, the original olive shoot were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, that is speaking about your relationship to Christ, okay, some of the branches of Israel were broken off and you were grafted in. We understand this stuff, right? We're orchardists, or at least we know an orchardist, right? We, we get this here. So this new branch shares the nourishing root of the olive tree. Next verse. Do not become arrogant toward the branches. 
If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root supports you. He's speaking to us, the new tenants. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Paul replies, that is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. Don't think all is well because you said a prayer when you were eight years old. Are you producing fruit? Is the point that's on the table. Verse 21. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Next verse 22. Note the kindness and severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but kindness towards you. We're the unnatural branches grafted in. We're the new tenants brought in to produce fruit because the first tenants would not. Will God judge us? Will God judge Christians? That seems evident here by Paul's words, by Jesus' words. If it wasn't enough, let me read for you something more clear from 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we, must, we, speaking to Christians, that's you and me, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Will you be judged? Most definitely, you will be. You say, well, I thought, Pastor John, we weren't going to be judged once we accepted Jesus. Well. Here's where you need to understand this and pay very close attention for the next 30 seconds, if you haven't already been. You will not be judged for sin. You will be judged for lack of fruit production. Good or evil. The word evil means worthless in the original language. You'll, you'll be rewarded, tenants. Listen closely, new tenants. This sounds just like it would come from the owner of the vineyard. You will be rewarded by the worth of the fruit you produce. Is that unreasonable? No. And that's exactly what it is. Are you producing good fruit for the vineyard owner? So, no, you will not be judged for sin. You're not going to hope that things turn out okay when you get to heaven. Uh, well, I believed in Jesus. No, you believe in Jesus. You're with him. You're in but what is going to be the level of your reward, Christian friend, new tenant? Are you going to make it in by the skin of your teeth, as Jesus said and as Paul said? Or will you enjoy much reward and joy? Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said about this passage in Mark 12. Remember once more that if you do not hear the well-beloved Son of God, you have refused your last hope. He's speaking here to the unsaved, the unconverted. Remember once more that if you do not hear the well-beloved Son of God, you have refused your last hope. He is God's ultimatum. Nothing remains when Christ is refused. No one else can be sent. Heaven itself contains no further messenger. If Christ is rejected, hope is rejected. I should like every person here that is unconverted to remember that there is no one, there is no other gospel, no more sacrifice for sin. Rejecting Christ, it, you have rejected all. You have, shut against, you have shut against yourself the only door of hope. If you're here this morning and have never embraced Jesus Christ, he's get God's last attempt. <laughs> there will be no more attempts. Those of us who are in this room who have embraced him, the question remains, are you bearing fruit in the vineyard that God has provided for you? Friends, we must receive the one and only Son of the Father. He has been sent to us by God. Whether you have never embraced Jesus the Son or you have embraced him at some point in the past, now is the moment of truth. Paul said, now is the day of salvation. Not yesterday, not maybe tomorrow, now. Now. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. How have you responded to him? 
It's a great Christmas thought. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we receive you. I wish I could say words that would affect the hearts of every person in this room that would not only affect but reflect the hearts of every person in this room when I say we receive you, Lord Jesus. For that is the only God-honoring, God-glorifying, joy-producing response. There is no other response. To say maybe tomorrow or yes when I was a child is inadequate. And so, Holy Spirit, we now come to you and we ask that you would do what only you can do, and that is to change the hearts of not only people who don't know you, but of your own people. Those of us who might have grown indifference to the great responsibility, the great privilege that we have to produce fruit in your vineyard. Holy Spirit, do your work in us, all of us, whether we have embraced Christ Jesus and attempt to follow him daily, or whether we have never done that. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Confront us where we are. Present Christ to us anew, afresh. And cause our hearts to openly receive him and pursue him wholeheartedly. Lord Jesus, we receive you, the only Son, from the, vineyard, the owner of the vineyard. Blessed be your name. Amen.